But it gives me uh, really, really a special um, uh, honour to introduce our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, because he's come all the way from Canada. Chief Robert Davis from the Lethbridge Regional Police Service uh, in Alberta, Canada. Chief Robert Davis is a Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. He has served as a, a police officer for 26 years and was sworn in as the Chief of the Lethbridge Regional Police Service in January 2015. Chief Davis has had a number of career highlights, including championing the drive that led to Six Nations becoming the first Aboriginal Police Service to join the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario, contributing to the development and delivery of courses designed to combat the impacts of gangs and organised crime on Aboriginal populations, and he was instrumental in the creation and operation of a multi-agency operation targeting organised crime. Chief Davis is the recipient of the prestigious Gimborne Scholarship from the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police and the International Police Association for his efforts combating gangs and organised crime. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a very, very warm Australian welcome to Chief Robert Davis, all the way from Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my sincere pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Queensland Police Service for the invitation, uh, Inspector Les Bullis for returning the hospitality uh, that I was able to extend to him in 2010 when he came to visit me when I was working at Six Nations and to see Aboriginal policing models in our fine country. Uh, I am a Mohawk. I am a status Indian. In Canada, we have the Indian Act, as it's called, and I carry a little red card that says that it's my certificate of Indian status, and I am proud to be a Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, in our language, hello is Sago. So from Six Nations, I say Sago, uh, but I need to first uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the territory on which we are here today. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a fast, I've been here for a week before the conference started, and I've been in policing 26 years, and the, ma uh, the majority of that has been in Aboriginal policing. And I cannot stress to you, it is uncanny, the similarities between our two countries. I had the opportunity yesterday to go to Cherbourg. I had asked Les, I said, I, I grew up on a reserve. Uh, I wanted to see what was similar. And I find this humorous uh, as uh, we, we drive, uh, we're pulling into Cherbourg. And I knew we were getting close to the community. And where I grew up on Six Nations, we have stray dogs that we call res dogs, reserve dogs. And a res dog is basically a mutt. It's a, it's a stray dog. And, they can live to be about 106 years old. You can shoot them, run them over with a car. They can have disease, and they'll live forever. And as we're pulling the Cherbourg, all of a sudden, I see three or four what I call res dogs. And I guess they're called camp dogs. I tell you, I felt right at home. It was great. So a lot of similarities. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is some of the things we've, we've tried in Canada. I'm a, I'm a practitioner. I'm a journeyman. I like to refer to myself. If I can get this. Give me one sec. Perfect. But before we uh, get going, I want to acknowledge something. This is our week of remembrance in Canada. November 11th is our Remembrance Day. And as a child growing up in the areas I policed early in my career, we had a number of Air Force bases during the Second World War with the Royal, uh, part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And a number of uh, pilots and aircraft uh, personnel were killed in training accidents during World War II in these bases. And I would drive by these, the Jarvis, the Hegersville bases, daily on my way to work at Six Nations. I took less to see them. Uh, similarly, when I was working in the Dunville area. And at the time, I remember being just awestruck uh, to see members of the Royal Australian Air Force, members of the Royal New Zealand Air Force uh, on the commemoration stones there. So I'd first like to acknowledge any veterans in the crowd that were serving in the military prior to becoming police officers or academics or whatever field you're in. Thank you for your service because November 11th in Canada, uh, that's the day we truly honour you. And I am sincere when I say any of us in policing, we are blessed to do our job because those in the military do their job. And so because it's the week remembers back home, I want to acknowledge those that gave their lives in training accidents in the British Commonwealth or training plan in the area that I grew up in. Uh, specifically, leading air craftsman R. McNabb, pilot officer K. Slater, leading air craftsman C. Taggart, and flight sergeant J. B. Watts of the Royal Australian Air Force, 
Sergeant Jay Whitehead of the Royal New Zealand Air Force, who were killed in training accidents at Number One Bombery and Gunning School, Jarvis. I'd also like to acknowledge Sergeant Clarence Anderson, Flight Sergeant Brian Evans, Pilot Officer Kenneth Lee from the Royal Australian Air Force, who were tragically killed in training accidents at Number Six Flying Training School in Dunville. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of these uh, gentlemen are leading air craftsmen. Stan Green, John Howarth, Alistair Rankin, Alexander Willis, and Noel Wood. Uh, because I, I do believe uh, Remembrance Day is a key date for us in our history, and it's because of that, the, the contributions of people during World War II and those in uh, events that have followed wars and conflicts. And again, because of the military and the job they do, we get to do the job that we do. So again, to any of you vets out there, big round of applause, thank you for your service. So I call myself a journeyman. Uh, I like to think of myself as a journeyman. Any of you that are tradesmen, uh, it's, I, I steal the term from there. I like to think of myself as being fairly proficient at my craft, and because of that, I've been able to be a journeyman and, and go to work for a number of police services. I started my career with the Haldeman Norfolk Regional Police uh, at 19 years of age as a special constable in their auxiliary police program while I was going to university. And then I was approached by Chief Glenn Lickers to start be part of this new experiment in Canada called Aboriginal Policing. And it was Aboriginal police services staffed by Aboriginal police officers to police Aboriginal communities. And I grew up on Six Nations, and it was a tough community growing up. And I was approached, and I remember telling my chief, or at that time, I wasn't, he wasn't my chief yet, I'll give you five years, but that's it. And after that, I'm going on to somewhere else, whether it be, whether it be the RCMP or the Ontario Provincial Police, but I'll give you five years. 18 years later, I was still there. It is a calling. I firmly believe policing Aboriginal populations, whether it be on reserve in a community like Cherbourg or in an urban, or an urban area, it truly is a calling. Uh, from Six Nations Police, I, I had topped out where I could go because of the structure of the organization and our age demographics. So I was approached to apply for an inspector job at Nishnabi Yaski Police. If any of you watch Ice Road Truckers, uh, I oversaw 21 detachments in that area. I'm being sincere. The only way in was Ice Road or by aircraft. An incredible experience and also a very sad experience for me because I saw really third world conditions in Canada's backyard that the majority of society is never going to see and I think because of that they tend to ignore. We saw incredible rates of violence and we saw incredible rates of suicide. But it was overall a great experience for me uh, as a police officer and as a human being. Uh, from there, I, re I was seconded to the Canadian Police College. I returned back to Six Nations Police on paper, but I really moved to Ottawa on secondment to the Royal Canadian Police at the Canadian Police College, CPC, which is our institution for advanced police learning. And while I was there, I was able to travel the country looking at Aboriginal policing models in cities, in rural settings, and help developing curriculum for police leaders to understand that how we address Aboriginal policing issues, whether it be in a city, whether it be in a rural area, whether it be on, you know, on a reserve as we call them, you have to be creative, you have to be different, and you cannot have a cookie cutter approach. And so I was very honored to do that. Uh, from there, I went back to Six Nations to address an organized crime problem. And as much as we're here to talk about prevention, and I full-heartedly do believe in prevention, there's an old country music song by a country legend, Merle Hager, called Walking on the Fighting Side of Me. And when organized crime groups exploit Aboriginal populations in our country, in your country, in any country, that's walking on the fighting side of me. And so at Six Nations, I was asked to come back because organized crime was infiltrating our community, the community I grew up. And so it was a calling to come back and help address that. Uh, but from there, I, I was uh, ready for a move. And the Dryden Police Service, which is located in northwestern Ontario, approximately three hours from Winnipeg, was looking for a chief. But it had realized, their municipal leadership realized they have a reserve on each side, Wabi Goon and Eagle Lake, and they wanted a police chief that was going to be willing to work and embrace the Aboriginal populations, form strong friendships, partnerships, and have community engagement for public safety, for overall well-being of all communities, all citizens, whether it be the city of Dryden or the neighboring reserves. It was a fascinating time of my life, and I'll just tell you right now, uh, Dryden, as much as I loved it, I coached football, American Rules football there. Uh, this time of year, we would be playing in snow, so, so it's a stark contrast to the weather we have here. 
uh, I was in Dryden from 2011 till 2015, and at which point I was in a competition to be the chief of Lethbridge Regional Police. Now, Lethbridge brought another unique challenge. Where I grew up is the largest reserve in Canada based on population. We have a band membership of 23,000, and we are the largest based on population. We're about two hours from Toronto. Where I am now in Lethbridge, Alberta, I'm two hours directly south of Calgary, Banff, that area. But right next door is the Blood Tribe Reserve, which is the largest landmass reserve in our country, uh, with her, and I th around 15,000 on their ban list. In the city of Lethbridge, we have 16% of our population of 100,000, 16% of that being Aboriginals. And I'll be quite honest, and I love it in Lethbridge, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done in the community engagement of the Aboriginal population. And it's work that was going to get done because the timing is right. We have a new provincial government, we have a new federal government, we have municipal leadership that truly understands that we need to engage the Aboriginal community. We cannot continue paternalistic attitudes of the past, paternalistic practices. Uh, we're in it together, I like to say. So I'm a journeyman, and that's where uh, I feel I'm pretty good at my craft. Oops. Uh, down there is the Toronto area, that's where I started policing. Up in this area is the Ice Road Truckers area, and where I am now, I'm in southern Alberta right here, closer to the Montana border. In Canada, that's a representation of the number of reserves, but what's quite fascinating is our Aboriginal population is the fastest growing demographic in our country, and a lot of the migration is going to urban centres. So again, uh, it's a, dealing with Aborig Aboriginal issues is something that cannot be ignored or overlooked by anybody. We need to be in this, and it has to be healthy, true engagement and partnerships. These are some key dates of policing Aboriginal people in Canada. So I have to give you a bit of a history lesson as we go through this so you understand the context. Uh, 1960s when Aboriginal people were allowed to vote in our country. So you really didn't see any political activism or discussions about policing our populations until after that date. And it was because of early discussions in the late 60s that in 1973, uh, at that time it was called the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, struck a task force to look at policing options of Aboriginal populations, and I'll speak to that later. But a key date, because that's the first real real discussion that happened in Canada about policing Aboriginal populations. In 1990, we had the Oka crisis, which pitted our military against Mohawk protesters uh, over a land dispute in Oka, uh, Ganesatage area of Quebec. Uh, and it was a very uh, prolonged standoff in the summer of 1990. And at that time, it was one of our largest military expenditures, which is sort of a sad statement when you think about it, that our largest military expenditure prior to the Gulf War and after the Korean War was uh, amongst our own people. Uh, but it did have the positive outcome of forcing a commission on Aboriginal people. So the commission started its work in 1992, and in 1996 the results were, were published. But in, in between, you saw the, the ghost of Oka, I'll call it, happen. We had the Iprawash standoff, where you had Aboriginal protesters in a land dispute challenging the OPP, and ultimately a protester by the name of Dudley George was shot and killed. Uh, you had Gustus and Lake happening out in BC. You had a number of uh, Aboriginal protests where uh, the paternalistic attitudes were not going to be just taken as status quo and you saw uh, conflict. Uh, in 1996, as a result of the, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, we saw the formalization of the First Nations policing program and policy. So those discussions from 1973 had morphed into a trial period in 1990 to 1996. We saw a real formal document put together about policing, uh, First Nations policing, and it was formalized. And I was fortunate enough to be tucked under the wing of my chief at the time, Glenn Lickers, and be part of those consultation discussions in 95 uh, that led to that 96. In uh, 2005, we had a huge standoff again between Aboriginal protesters and the Ontario Provincial Police in southern Ontario uh, over in a town called Caledonia, a town I went to high school in, over a land development called Douglas Creek Estates. And again, it turned violent, a very prolonged standoff, and some very polarized attitudes came out of it. But it demonstrates that the conflicts of the mid-90s still were brewing. Those, those, those waters were still boiling for potential, and we saw it out in, in 2005. Uh, in 2005, we saw a conservative government come in. And I'm going to stress right now, I am nonpartisan. Uh, one thing I like to tell young officers, I have worked for provincial governments and federal governments that have been liberal, conservative, NDP. They've all come and gone, and I'm still in policing. 
So never hit your wagon to one political party. But I will make a comment uh, that from 2005 to 2015, we had a conservative government where we saw all focus, dedication, and funding to Aboriginal programs, whether it be health, education, justice, or policing, the funding was drying up. And finally, in 2015, we had a federal election, and we were, uh, I like to, any Star Wars fans in here, a new hope. Uh, we, we had our new hope in Canada with this guy. <laughs> Uh, funny side story, I got to meet the Prime Minister three weeks ago on the Blood Tribe Reserve, Chief Kyle Melting Tallow, the Acting Chief of Police for their police service, and I worked very closely together. And so he said, the Prime Minister's coming out, come on out, be part of the detail. Great. And it was kind of by a fluke, I wound up in the back room of one of the facilities and the Prime Minister came out that day. And ladies, I have to, I have to attest, he is as dreamy as he's <laughs> I was a bit skeptical when I was there, but when he walked out, he is tall, he is slender, he has beautiful blue eyes. I can't believe I'm doing this, but <laughs> I was starstruck. And so fumbling for words, all I had was, uh, uh, keep up the good work, sir. <laughs> and thinking, wow, he is dreamy. <laughs> But it is a time of new hope. It is a time of renewal with Prime Minister Trudeau. It is an exciting time. And I'm, a, I'm sort of sad on one hand because I was around for the discussions in 94, 95 that led to the 96 uh, FNPP. But I'm now the corporate memory for the new renewal discussions. So it's sad on one hand that you have to look yourself in the mirror and realize you're getting old. But it's exciting because we have that guy. Oh. <laughs> And I really do, uh, I, a comment, again, an observation. In the short time our Prime Minister has been a year, he's been in power. He has visited so many Aboriginal communities that it's, it's unprecedented, unprecedented in our country. To see him come to the Blood Tribe Reserve, the Sutina Reserve, to engaging with the Assembly of First Nations, we haven't seen that in our history. So it's an exciting time to be in policing and, and dealing with Aboriginal issues, whether they be on a reserve or in an urban setting. Uh, just, I won't dwell on this too much, but we had the, the report of the task force. Like I said, it was commissioned in two, uh, 1973. Uh, it was by Indian Affairs, and the Minister of Indian Affairs at that time was a young minister by the name of Jean Chrétien, who later went on to become our Prime Minister. Jean Chrétien is also, uh, his other claim to fame is writing the, writing the White Paper, which was an assimilation policy for Aboriginal people. So uh, you can understand how there might be a little bit of distrust from the Aboriginal populations when the person that wrote an assimilation paper on you is now writing a policing paper on you, or overseeing it, rather. And the other fatal flaw, and I'm glad that we're talking about evidence-based policing, because we see this time and time again in our history and policing in Canada, is we'll strike a task force, we're going to research something. What's the first thing we do is we pull out some old retired member to be the lead of it. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. You see the humor in it. And I'll tell you, when I was young and naive, I didn't really care. But as I get older and a little bit more bitter, not bitter, cynical, <laughs> we need to partner with academia. And you know, to the retired members, stay retired or go get your PhD and come back. But when we bring people back from, from the, they tend to have that tunnel vision. They're stuck in past practices. So I see a fatal flaw in the report and by the fact that they had a deputy commissioner come back to see it. Smart man, brilliant man, but I just see a fatal flaw that we continually do in, in Canada. But one thing I want to point out is in 1973, they identified limited, it, the, the task force had, uh, had parameters and the, the task force limited its scope to policing on reserves. Indians living in urban centers made up another and much larger group, very much aware that this will be an area of increasing concern. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the roosters have come home to roost. It's estimated that at least 50% of our Aboriginal population is living off reserve now in urban centers. Uh, we are the fastest growing de demographic in Canada and the population uh, by and large, the youth especially are moving to urban centers. So it's an issue that urban or municipal police services have to be embraced and, and understand the dynamics uh, to make sure we have positive change uh, so that we are engaged in the community with the ultimate goal of decreasing the incarceration rates, having more positive interactions with the police versus uh, negative interactions. Uh, these are a number of things straight from the report, but the ones in red are the ones that stick out uh, that is being, even though they were written in 1973, they have some relevance today. 
And in the this first one, each region, the first one in red, each region has its own particular policing problems. Indian consultation could only be carried out at the regional level and solutions would vary greatly region to region. It goes on to say that to do it massively uh, would be too comprehensive and be a lot of work, uh, but it acknowledges in 1973 the problems, the issues, the challenges are different region to region to region. So that's written in 1973, and I can tell you today, in 2016, we still, our government still wants to push a cookie cutter approach to Aboriginal issues. And when you go down to the provinces, we call them provinces versus states, but when you go to our provinces, it's the same dynamic. Is we recognize that the issues in the southern part of a province are different than the far north of a province, but what do we do? We roll out a cookie cutter approach that's going to fit everybody. One size fits all. It doesn't work. And it was identified in 1973. And so any of you that are in Aboriginal, are dealing with Aboriginal populations and policing, I urge you, if you take nothing else away from my, my conversation, take that that the issues vary from region to region to region. And it never fails that somebody will say, well, to, you know, to do it region to region, it's quite expensive, quite time consuming. Well, I am standing here as living proof that 21 years of doing the same thing is not working. So maybe had we invested the money on the front end to do a region to region approach with region to region consultation and develop region to region solutions, we may not be where we are today, which is really the status quo, if not maybe a bit degraded from 1996. Uh, the other thing I have in red here is there is a need for preventative policing, approve upon the complaint oriented system. Again, this is written in 1973. I'm sure it's the same as in Australia. I know it's the same for my friends in the US. I know it's the same for my colleagues in Germany, that when economic times become tough and our funding is uh, restricted or starting to be uh, frozen or sometimes reduced, one of the first things that we eliminate our training and proactive preventative policing measures, those the soft programs as some people will call them. But there's a need, again identified in 1973, that there is a need for preventative policing. I would suggest that the evolution of that is what we call wraparound policing services or wraparound community services to address root causes. But it was something I identified 43 years ago. And this is something that I find fascinating from the actual report of the task force. The opening sentence is this. The economic and social development of a community is related directly to the, degree, to the degree of law and order which prevails in that community. I would suggest that here we sit 43 years later, we now understand it's actually the opposite. That if we can address the root causes, education, health, social services, uh, addiction issues, you name it, FASD, if we can ad address all of those social and economic conditions, those will produce a, uh, a safe community. So I think they had it backwards in 1973. But it's easy to sit here 43 years later and judge, but I just find this fascinating that that was the mindset uh, that, that was guiding policing and really stayed in place for a number of years. Uh, early 1990s, again, we had the Oka crisis. We saw the launch of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And then uh, we saw the actual establishment of the First Nations policing program, which led to a number of Aboriginal police services designed to deliver culturally appropriate policing models to Aboriginal communities uh, staffed by Aboriginal police officers. And the first uh, go at it from 91 was to 96, and then in 96 it was evaluated and the formal policy came out. Uh, the mid-90s, again, we had the Upper Wash standoff, the Gustafson Lake standoff. Uh, we had the consultations and evaluations for the first five years, which led to the 1996 First Nations policing policy. And we saw the release of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. The report is five volumes, it's quite comprehensive and looked at a number of issues, health, education, social economic. But a big part of it was justice. Because what was clear in the report then in 1996 was Aboriginal were overrepresented in the jails, both federal prisons and provincial prisons. The interaction with the police was higher than the, the rest of the country. And all the things that we see today were still prevalent, or were prevalent back in 1996. So there were a number of recommendations uh, that were put forward to try and reduce the incarceration rates or negative interaction with police. The overall goal was to reduce that and also to address systemic discrimination. 
uh, there was a lot of great work done in the Aboriginal, in, in the court system, such as creating Aboriginal courts, Aboriginal court workers and liaisons, because uh, we would see it when we would be policing, where people had no concept of the justice system. We dealt with them as the front end for, when we would arrest, but once they were actually in the process, they had no concept of the actual process. And quite often, it's people, people plead guilty just to get it done. And it's really not fair. If you don't understand the game, it's not fair to have you play it. And I don't like to call it a game, but this analogy I use. Uh, but the Aboriginal court workers and liaison, worth their weight in gold. I can tell you as the journeyman and the practitioner, we would see this. When I was working in the far north, you would see the value of this person. When I was working in the north, you would see communities where the Aboriginal language was the first language, another Aboriginal language was the second language, and English would be the third. Then we rolled into this Euro-Canadian justice system, which is all written in English and legalese, it was easier to plead guilty. So this was a critical function that had great success at helping people understand the rights, understanding the system, as well as the Aboriginal Justice of the Peace program, because we had Aboriginal Justice of the Peace magistrates uh, that came from First Nations communities and understood the nuances of the culture. Uh, we had elders panels. We saw the beginning of sentencing circles, restorative justice. We saw healing, a focus on healing versus punishment. But the unfortunate part was it all hinged on federal or provincial funding. And so as governments changed, you saw the focus, the ambition, the drive to stay on those, those areas uh, and the funding attached to them begin to dry up. But one that you did see survive was Aboriginal policing. However, not without issues. So in 1996, uh, the Royal Canadian Ab uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. It bolsters the First Nations policing program. It says, yes, it's legitimate, let's try it. Uh, but we were considered a program. We were not considered an essential police service. Every other police service in Canada is considered an essential police service, an essential service. But in Aboriginal policing, we were considered a program, and by extension, our funding was attached to uh, agreements that sometimes were in one-year increments, two-year increments, or three-year increments. Now, any senior police leaders here, I would like to ask you, how can you strategically plan for the future when your funding is in a one-year cycle or a two-year cycle, and in the best case scenario, and rarely, a three-year cycle? You just can't do it. Uh, we saw the infrastructure wasn't supported, the supports such as uh, administrative staff, support staff uh, weren't funded through the FNPP, and the funding was not sustainable. Every year we used to call it collective begging. We would go and beg for our funding for the next year and try and get a two-year or three-year agreement so we could do some sort of planning. Uh, as time went on, it, it was more typical to have a one-year agreement. Uh, the agreement lengths were usually one, and then the evaluation. So remember what I said at the start, regional problems, regional solutions, yet we had this cookie cutter approach and more frustrating is the scorecard we used to deal with unique issues was the scorecard that's been used for 40 years. Number of arrests, number of convictions, length of sentence. Well, I think we've set up a system where it's not, the, the scorecard isn't correct. We're using the wrong scorecard. And, but to this day, as we speak, that is still the scorecard that's being used. And when, and when Aboriginal Police Services will try and discuss it with the federal government, the Public Safety Canada, the funders, it's always that, well, that's the way we've always done it. Those are the measurables. We have to be able to measure it. Well, I would suggest, and it was in uh, Deputy Commissioner Martin's presentation about using data, and we can move into qualitative data, quantitative data. We need to go that direction because the current evaluation of number of arrests, number of convictions, length of sentences is not working. By 2015, First Nations policing program was literally in survival mode. Uh, the largest Aboriginal police service in the country, Nishnabi Aski Police Service, was on the brink of collapse, folding its doors. A number of police services throughout the last decade have collapsed. My home police service is the flagship of Aboriginal policing, Six Nations Police. Uh, it and the Aquasesne Police Service have managed to survive. But I'll tell you a little bit, and my wife can attest to this, uh, us Mohawks, I like to say we're driven, we're a little bit stubborn. So when we realized that the money was drying up, uh, we always sort of had this cynical sense, the government's trying to do this on purpose, they want to show that we're going to fail. Never do that to a Mohawk, because we're like those res dogs, we're resilient, you can run us over, shoot us, and infect us with disease, we're going to survive and live to 106. So we closed ranks and survived as Aquasesne and Six Nations Police. But beyond that, you saw the other Aboriginal police services in the country really struggling. 
And by the end of 2015, uh, there was really some doubt if uh, it was going to continue. But there he is. There he is. <sighs> that breath of fresh air, our Prime Minister has made a sincere commitment. It started as an election promise. And we were quite cynical in the Aboriginal community that, oh, it's another promise. We've heard this before. But he has moved so quickly in one year to move on election promises that we're seeing a lot of things happening in Aboriginal policing. Most specifically, a commitment to the renewal of the First Nations policing program and policy. It's going to be completely rewritten. We don't know what it's going to look like in the future. I, have been, I was able to participate in the uh, consultation discussions for Western Canada uh, last month. And I was unique in the sense that I was there as a city bordering the largest geographical reserve in Canada. And my argument, or my position, not argument, my position is uh, we have vested interests in this as a city because we have 16% of our population are Aboriginal. The issues on the reserve uh, challenges do not stop miraculously when people come into the city or vice versa. And so we need to develop this policy in harmony with all police services, whether they be federal, provincial, or municipal or First Nation agencies. But we're seeing the commitment by the Trudeau Liberal government to move forward on this, and the consultations are ongoing. And it's interesting because Having been part of the 94, 95, 96 consultations and being young and naive and Aboriginal policing being relatively new, we kind of got hoodwinked because uh, the government came in, it was a lot of PowerPoints and you know cheerleading stories and the good and the fuzzy. This was starting uh, the consultation group I was in, in in last month and Public Safety Canada started with the, the slide deck of, oh, look how wonderful things are in Aboriginal policing and look how wonderful things are in Aboriginal communities. And I applaud the leadership of those communities, the, 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 the council leadership and the, the community leadership, because they stood up and they said, no, things are not wonderful. They are not warm and fuzzy. Things need to change. And if this is going to be a one-way conversation, do not go back and call it meaningful consultation, because it's not. It's a one-way conversation, and we as the Aboriginal community will not accept that anymore. And I was like, yeah, you turned a mohawk on me. I was so proud of everybody in that room. So uh, the consultations were actually two-way conversations, uh, real dialogue, where the Aboriginal communities were telling the government what they want to see in policing models moving forward. And what was very interesting for me, and I had this conversation last night at the, at the meal. I was asked, when I started in Aboriginal policing, I left the municipal police service to go to Aboriginal policing when it was just starting up. And, and I was asked, were you ever called a sellout by your other Aboriginal or colleagues, friends, family? And I said, absolutely, we all were. The original 10 of us, we were called sellouts. We were called apples, red on the outside, white on the inside. You know, we were the brown window dressing, you name it. We were called all these names. But it's fascinating for me uh, that we, we got through that and we struggled to be recognized as equals in the policing world. But here we sit 20 years later, and what was very clear in those discussions last month is the Aboriginal community wanted to see more self-administered Aboriginal police services. So in, in our equivalent of Cherbourg, a reserve, there was a real call to see Aboriginal police services policing those, and there's a real call to see Aboriginal people policing Aboriginal populations in urban centres. And I know it gets a little controversial when you start wanting to dictate who's going to police certain masses, but this is just the feedback that was coming out. And I think that for me it was justification that I'm glad I stuck it out. And like I said at the start, Aboriginal policing is truly a calling. And I am truly honoured to have been part of that 20-year cycle to sit there and see 20 years later from being called the sellout, the apple, and this, to where communities are saying, we want Aboriginal police officers policing us. So a testament to those that were part of that first generation. And I have to really acknowledge some key people uh, in policing, in my policing career and in the policing profession back in Canada that shaped my life and my outlook. The first being uh, Detective Constable Andrew Johnson, Jr., we call him. And when I was a young special constable with the Hull of the Norfolk Regional Police, uh, even before that, I really was heading towards the military. And it was a junior, Andrew, that approached me and said, you know what, you bring a skill set that would be unique to policing. And at that time, he was uh, one of the handful of Aboriginals in policing in the country. And he convinced me to try it. So I went in as a special constable uh, while I was going to university. And I'll tell you, Junior and I would walk into the Albert Hotel and the Aboriginal community would turn on Junior and I right away because we were the sellouts. 
But it taught me a lesson in perseverance and, and that this is a calling. If we want to make a difference in policing Aboriginal populations, it's a calling. The other person I want to acknowledge is Chief Glenn Lickers, uh, the Chief of Six Nations Police. Because Glenn was at RCMP initially. He joined the RCMP in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, served for 10 years, and then was approached to come back and lead our police service in our home community. And Glenn, it took a little while to sink in, as you can all appreciate as a young officer. We know everything. It's, uh, you know, kick butt and take names. We know what we're doing. And he would repeatedly tell me throughout my career, the default position of arrest and incarceration is easy. Anybody can do that. If you really want to challenge yourself and make a difference, don't default to the easy route of rest and incarceration. Make a difference in people's lives. And it's really stuck with me. And I cannot thank Glenn Lickers for those words of wisdom and support he's given me throughout my career uh, because there's a lot of pressure to default to the norm of rest and incarceration and what's the traditional practices. But those are two key people that uh, have shaped me, and Glenn Lickers has been a leader in Aboriginal policing in Canada and continues to be today. He'll be retiring soon, and I'll tell you, uh, there'll be a great void when he leaves because he's just been phenomenal. But it's re again, it's rewarding to see that here we sit now, and Aboriginal communities want to see, and Aboriginal populations want to see Aboriginals policing them. Where the struggle is, is the representation and the recruiting of Aboriginal members. Uh, in Canada, Aboriginals make up 4.3% of our population in the 2011 census, but and all, Aboriginals are also the fastest growing demographic in our country. As I said earlier, a large number of those are migrating to urban centres, to our cities. There's a number of efforts going on by all police services to attract Aboriginal recruits, but to be quite honest, most are struggling and actually quite fascinating. I sit on a subcommittee for the Canadian Association of the Chiefs of Police, uh, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Working Group, and actually the Aboriginal police services are turning people away, whereas all the rest of us in provincial, federal, and municipal policing are struggling to, retract, to attract, recruit, and retain Aboriginal police officers. Uh, some are having minimal success, uh, it's a work in progress. I will applaud the jurisdictions that have put in, that they want to mirror the representation, or want, that they want to reflect their community, so with us a goal would be to be 4.3. The city of Lethbridge, we're 16% Aboriginal, I would love to have a police service that's reflective of that and we'll work towards that, but it's a work in progress. And I understand in, in Queensland that the target has been set for 3% uh, that mirrors the population, and good on you. Uh, you have to do that. And I know it brings up, it's contentious sometimes, because I've heard it all. Oh, we're going to have reverse discrimination. Oh, we won't hire white guys anymore. Oh, it's, we're watering down our policing standards. I've heard it all. And to be quite honest, initially I ignored it, but as I sit here older, I take offense to it when people suggest that because a person's from a different racial background that that's watering down, down the standards. We all know that's not the case, and I applaud Queensland for being so progressive in this uh, that you're going to meet those. But what I would suggest is that when you hit that magic number, so for us 16% in Lethbridge, nationally 4.3% in Canada, for you 3% in Queensland, but whatever you do, when you hit that number, do not do this. Because if you remember this great scene, good old George W, Iraq War II, or sorry, uh, Iraqi Freedom II was over, mission accomplished. Well, here we sit a decade later and it's debatably still going on. Uh, the, the takeaway being is if you have a target, do not hit the target and then mission accomplished, we've reached the goal. It has to be a sustained effort, and I would suggest that you have to go beyond that. As long as your incarceration rates of Aboriginals are at the rates they are, and a great timing for me, because I was here last week, I got to watch the media on the uh, commission report that came out last week on your incarceration rates, very similar to ours. So as long as those rates are higher, I would suggest that you sh it would be a good practice to aim a bit higher than just the 3% and for us to higher than the 4.3%. Next, I'll drift into crime courts and the justice system. So the, the, what I've talked about is the policing where we're at, and I'm a firm believer that uh, having lived it, breathed it, seen it, that the, the Aboriginal pop people, policing Aboriginal populations, is, it is an advantage. Again, just that, that cultural, understanding the culture, but also the nuance. Just those little nuances, mannerisms, things that you can't learn in a PowerPoint, that you can't learn in a classroom. If you've lived that, 
It gives you such an advantage for ingratiation and relationship building. And so that's where I urge uh, all of you uh, to embrace Aboriginal, more Aboriginal police officers in your respective police services because they do bring that understanding of more than culture, understanding the nuance uh, of a specific uh, tribe or band, as we call them. With respect to crime courts and the justice system, 1996, after the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, uh, it was clear our incarceration rates are way higher than the rest of Canada, typically around 25% compared to the rest of the country. Uh, our offender recidivism rates were higher than the national average. Our victimiza victimization of uh, violent crime was typically three to four times more than the average Canadian. And what we started to see in 1996 was our rates of missing and murdered Aboriginal women uh, were higher than others. We had a, an event, and I'll speak to the, the inquest later, in Vancouver area called the uh, Robert Picton case. And Robert Picton would prey on marginalized women in the East uh, Hastings District of Vancouver, and a high number of those were Aboriginal. He uh, murdered over a dozen of them, and Op uh, Justice Opal spoke to the, the cracks in the system that led to that, and I'll get to that later. But in 1996 through into the late 90s, we see the rates of missing and murdered Aboriginal women is uh, disproportionately high compared to the rest of Canada. Out of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, one of the initiatives to try and reduce the number of people in incarceration was an amendment to our criminal code, 718.2 sub E. So these are our sentencing provisions. And what 718.2 sub E allowed was that the court imposes a sentence shall also, that a court that opposes a sentence shall also take into consideration the following principles. That all available sanctions other than imprisonment that are reasonable in the circumstance and consistent with the harm done to the victims or the community should, con should be considered for all offenders with particular attention to the circumstances of Aboriginal offenders. So we see this amendment to the Criminal Code in 1996, but you don't see it really being exercised. Until 1992, there's a case of Regina versus Gladu, and our Supreme Court makes a decision in 99 that we're not messing around, folks. We are expecting judges to adhere to sentencing guidelines. So as a result of the 1999 Gladue case, uh, we saw a real push from our Supreme Court of Canada telling all judges to adhere to the sentencing guideline with Aboriginal offenders. And what you would see was, we call it a Gladue report. And it looks at several considerations in sentencing uh, that are typically these, not limited to these, but it'll talk about the effects of the residential school system, or as you call it, the lost generations, uh, the child welfare and adoption system, the effects of dislocation and dispossession of Aboriginal peoples, family or community history of suicide, substance abuse or victimization, uh, the struggle with cultural, spiritual identity, lack of formal education, poverty, poor living conditions, and exposure to Aboriginal street gangs. So these, were, these are in the Gladue report, but I can tell you as a practitioner who's traveled the country, in Ontario, they're being used extensively. In British Columbia, they're being used extensively. When I moved to Alberta, I was quite shocked to see that they're not being used extensively. They're not really being used at all. And I can, I can kind of understand it because Gladue considerations, they're, they're a contentious issue. There's pros and there's cons. There's pros that it will take into consideration all those contributing factors that may result, the root causes we'll call them, that could result in the interaction with the justice system. And if we can identify those, let's try to find a sanction that will address the root causes. But the cons is, is that you see some Aboriginal communities, my home community of Six Nations being one of them, that took offense to the Gladue considerations. Uh, when I was dealing with the organized crime uh, issues on our community, we saw organized crime getting linked to the auto theft industry. And as a result, there was uh, all the periphery, the drugs, the violence, and risk to public safety with high-speed pursuits. And we would see people that were manipulating our youth uh, in, in the organized crime industry. And they were continually coming out of prison because of Gladue considerations. And it got to the point that our, our council leadership drafted a letter to our, our local judge and crown saying, we don't want Gladue considerations. The Aboriginal offender is putting our Aboriginal community at risk. Someone's going to get killed if you keep letting them out. And similarly, when I was in the north uh, talking about Gladue considerations, uh, Mike Matato Alban of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, I was very surprised when I was doing a talk on 
the need to, to balance GLIDU considerations when Mike stood up and said, thank you for saying what you've said, Rob, because it's frustrating for me as a, a political leader to see people that have harmed people in our community be back in our community after a court date before the victim's even back. So it's a contentious issue uh, because there are definitely some pros, uh, but there are some cons. And like I said, my home community, uh, GLIDU considerations really aren't 100% accepted. And one of the fascinating comments I had made to me one time was they asked me, Rob, let me get this straight. So my daughter got injured in a car crash because of an impaired driver, but because of GLIDU considerations, he's going to get a lighter sentence. But if we were non-native off the reserve, there wouldn't be any GLIDU considerations, so he would get a higher sentence or stiffer sentence. Does that mean that the value of the non-native life is more valuable than my daughter's life? Never thought of that. Fascinating question. Fascinating question. So while I do respect the need for those considerations of GLADU, they are not cut and dried and they are quite contentious and controversial in certain areas of the country. But the overall intent of GLADU, I support. If we can address those root causes, I think that we use the GLADU considerations in Canada so, Canada so that we can issue sanctions that will be treatment, rehabilitation to make the person whole, because we're throwing a lot of money away in our country and I suspect yours is the same trying incarceration. It doesn't work. We all know it doesn't work. But until we have something else in, in place, that's the system we're stuck with. We're seeing wraparound services or the hub model that were championed by Chief uh, Dale McPhee from uh, the Prince Albert Police Service in Saskatchewan, where you bring all of these social, education, health agencies together to address those root causes. And GLADU considerations allow for that. So there is some good, but at the same time, there are some cons. But here we sit 10, 20 years after the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People and when we look at the courts and the justice systems, all of those things I spoke to, did they really make a difference? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, the Aboriginal court liaison workers, again, they were worth their weight in gold, but they were, hin hit, they were hitched to funding. And the funding, when it dried up, those positions dried up. And so that function in our court system was gone. So you saw that gone. You saw the slowdown of the uh, Aboriginal Justice of the Peace Magistrate Program, and that had an impact. So all of those things that we saw high in 1996, they continue to be incredibly high in 2016. Uh, these are our incarceration rates. Since 2005-2006, we've seen a 43.5% increase in the federal Aboriginal. 43.5, that's, that's incredible. And again, last week I got to see the news here in Australia that you're having a similar dynamic. Aboriginal women are even more overrepresented than the men, and it's again one of our fastest growing demographics in the correction system and in our youth. You know, the good old definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So I think this just sort of emphasizes we need to do something different, and that's where the GLADU considerations I do think uh, play a part. 718 uh, sub 2 of the criminal code is very clear, all other sanctions. So our Crowns and our judges have a lot of latitude to consult with defense counsel uh, to come up with other practices. Restorative justice, a focus on rest restorative justice and rehabilitation versus crime and punishment. Healing circles, peacemaking. Uh, when I was out in uh, Cherbourg, I was fascinated to see their courtroom, how you have the typical courtroom, the judge, defense, crown attorney. But they said, we really don't use that. There was a long table with several chairs around, and they said, we have more of a discussion. Everyone sits at the same level and has a discussion. That's the way I think we need to move. And it's supported in Canada by a number of uh, uh, judges slash academics that have, have moved that direction. Judge John Riley was 20 years ahead of his time. If you ever get the chance, read the book Bad Medicine. He understood that the system wasn't working 20 years ago, and his efforts to change uh, caused him a lot of controversy in his career. But now John Riley can stand as a proud champion, a, a pioneer in addressing the changes that need to be done. Judge Barry Stewart retired again. Uh, if you ever get a chance, read his book, Peacemaking Circles, uh, From Crime to Community, or Google him, Judge Barry Stewart. He also has a, a, a website where he puts on academic articles on restorative justice. 
Rupert Ross, Return to the Teachings. I had the honour of working with Rupert when I was in Northwestern Ontario. And again, a pioneer that gets it. We can do some things differently. We do not have to... 718 allows some flexibility to think outside the box and try things that are new. Because remember that definition of insanity? What we're doing is not working. So we, can, we do have the ability through our sentencing provisions to do something different. And then where I'm working right now, uh, Mr. Tony Delaney and our Crown Attorney Bill Wister just retired, but they just won a national award in Canada for the Kainai peacemaking. And when we talk about evidence-based policing, they can demonstrate, they've kept the data, they've done the analysis, that their program of peacemaking, where no one's sitting higher than anyone else, no one's in robes or anything, when people sit in a format where everyone's equal and have a discussion with a focus on repairing their relationship so the person can continue in the community so that everybody walks away with some level of satisfaction, not a winner and loser that we have in our, our current justice system, it has success. Tony Delaney is an incredible young man. Uh, he's done an incredible job with the Kainai peacemaking and we're actually working together. We want to replicate the Kainai peacemaking in the city of Lethbridge for urban aboriginals. Uh, but I had a discussion yesterday with a person here in the crowd that the fascinating thing is once something works with the Aboriginal population, you see it then want to be spread to the greater society and sometimes it becomes a bureaucratic nightmare. So I'm not sure where we're going to wind up with it, but I can tell you that we're quite excited that we're hoping we can replicate the Kainai peacemaking program in the city of Lethbridge because it works. They've been recognized uh, in Canada because it works, the data shows it works, the recidivism rates are not what they uh, traditionally are, and people wind up rehabilitated, meaningful participate, participants in society. And to me, that's a success story. The other thing I'm just going to touch on quickly, because we're getting tight for time, are what, some things that are going on in Canada, commissions, inquiries, renewals, truth and reconciliation. As I said, we had the Picton murders, uh, where a number were marginalized uh, women in the East Hastings district of, of uh, Vancouver, and a number of those were Aboriginal. Uh, we currently have the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiry going on. We have the renewal discussions on the FNPP, and we now have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, it comes out of work done by the Commission from 2008 to 2015, and it really speaks to uh, the tragedy and, and damage of the residential school system, again, similar to your lost generations. We've seen a formal apology from our Prime Minister from Canada uh, for the residential schools, and the principles of the, the, of the TRC are truth-telling to address the injustices, healing, and reconciliation. Uh, we're in the infancy of this. We don't know what reconciliation really is going to look like, but I can tell you this. It cannot be a check-the-box exercise. It has to be prolonged, sustained, genuine, based on honest friendship and, and partnerships. The Truth and Reconciliation also had 94 calls to action, 18 of them aimed at the justice system. Well, guess who's the start of the justice system, folks? We are. So even though the, the TRC calls to action are aimed at the federal and provincial government, where the rubber hits the road is with the police because we're the first point of contact. So in Canada, I'm... I'm uh, dealing with my police commission that we have to take a proactive role in addressing these with the emphasis being on lowering those incarceration rates. The other part that's impacting policing are the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Inquiry, MMIW, and again it's, an imp it's, it's staggering the number of unsolved uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women in our country and the men are actually, the numbers are higher. So if you say Aboriginal people in general, it's staggering. But a public inquiry to focus on the root causes and remedies for the victimization of Aboriginal women is ongoing. And again, we're in our infancy, so some police agencies are struggling. Well, does that mean we do a cultural awareness PowerPoint, or what do we do? I will share a story with you with, uh, from the Olenic brothers of the OPP. When you investigate a homicide, it's the most devastating thing, and you know this, most devastating thing a family can ever go through. We owe it to them to share as much as we can to help them through that grieving process, that closure process. And people always say, well, we're just going to compromise our investigation. No, there's a balance. Because if we don't do that, it, it, people will fill in the blanks and it can cause us issues as the police. So we owe it to those families that when we have these serious investigations, we have to have that liaison and dialogue with them so that they're not left, left guessing. 
Uh, the OPAL report, again, what I spoke to uh, was on the missing, uh, the missing women out of BC, but one recommendation that really sticks out from that uh, that I encourage you all to consider is I make a number of proposals to empower police boards so that they are better empowered to carry out their community oversight function. First, police boards should be truly representative of the communities they serve, and I also recommend that they take steps, that steps be taken to in, ensure the representation of vulnerable and marginalized members and Aboriginal peoples on police boards. This is cutting edge in Canada. If I took you across the country and asked you to find me Aboriginal representation on city councils and on police boards, it would be definitely under what it should be. So that's a, a big statement from Justice Opal calling for Aboriginal representation on police governance boards. But really it boils down to this, meaning and real con uh, engagement. In the MMIW inquiry, Justice Opal has come out and said, uh, the Liberal government has to depart from the BC example and really involve the community. The Opal inquiry was led by the police. He's saying that there has to be some real community engagement as they do the MMIW inquiry. Uh, we've seen Judge Stewart, who's been an advocate for saying that police, the peacemaking circles, they make a difference and they have an effect and we have to move in that direction. And I've said it earlier, as we deal with Aboriginal populations and different initiatives, it cannot be a feel good, check the box exercise. First thing I said, and again, if you take anything away from here, regional issues with regional consultation and regional solutions. And to measure that, you're going to have to create a new scorecard and with the academic partnership, I'm confident we can do that so that we're not relying on the tools of yesterday to measure the future. And the other thing that I'm quite passionate about is the need for recruit, recruiting and retention development of Aboriginal police officers because we do bring value uh, to your organization. The other thing is your, what I read last week, same thing in Canada. We want action. The Aboriginal community wants action on these commissions. So we're in the infancy, and again, I'm very hopeful with the Trudeau government uh, that we'll see it. And uh, I write an article in our local paper, and I'll wrap this up and get in tight for time. Uh, but this is something I... It was controversial to write this where I am, because uh, again, it's it's a bit behind, uh, in my opinion, a bit behind where we should be as far as recruiting Aboriginals and engaging Aboriginals in all public sectors. But I wrote, when diverse groups are inside the organization as peers, it creates a mechanism for sharing and understanding each other that no PowerPoint presentation or guest speaker from diverse group A, B, or C will ever be able to provide. It provides a mechanism for intrinsic trust and understanding of different perspectives to be nurtured and over time normalized. It creates an unofficial accountability to shut down myths and rumors. It creates an incredible mechanism for those from diverse backgrounds to become the role models so that others can see what is achievable. I wrote that from the heart because I have lived it. I have had many conversations with non-Aboriginals to explain our differences and our similarities. I have built that intrinsic trust and I have seen other Aboriginal police officers do it. I've seen Aboriginal nurses do it. I've seen Aboriginal teachers do it. So I really, uh, this is another big one for me is that we have to engage our Aboriginal people and we have to, and I'm so proud of the Queensland Police with the, uh, the cadet program or I can't remember the proper name where you're developing people from diverse backgrounds to be part of your police service. But most importantly, it takes determination, a prolonged commitment, and courage. Because as Chief Lickers told me throughout my career, it's very easy to default back into Euro-Canadian policing for us, Euro-Australian policing for you of crime and punishment. It takes courage to think outside that box. And I just want to end this on a light note. I want to share with you a bit of a creation story. Uh, so, I mean no offense to anybody, uh, I'm going to have to make a, a bit of a biblical reference here with God and some, some of the saints. But uh, any of you who have been to Canada, it's beautiful. There we are, the green area. So as God was creating Canada, he'd already created Australia, and you know, you, your country is beautiful. So he's talking to some of the saints, and they said, God, why are you going to create another one? He goes, well, you know what, Australia is great, but I just think I want to do it again. I want to give it a few more mountains. So I'm going to give it a range of mountains with snow and beautiful rivers and wildlife and grizzly bears. So poof, he does it. You know what, and I want it to be, have an abundance of food. So I want acres and acres, as far as one can see, of wheat fields and barley fields. So poof, he created the prairies. 
Then he said, I want them to have an abundance of fresh water. So he created the Great Lakes and St. Peter's. Like, God, you're getting a little overboard here. Like, you didn't do that for Australia. You're getting a little overboard. Ah, yeah, I just want to get this one right. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to do the Maritimes. I'm going to give them lots of fishing. And you, you got that here. But I want to give them lobster and this and that. Great. Poof. And, and so St. Paul's like, God, you're really going crazy. He goes, you know what, and I want to have a vibrant north where it's just cold all the time. So if they ever need it, the icebergs will melt and then they'll fill the reservoir so they'll never have to worry about fresh water if the Great Lakes ever dry up. And they said, okay, God, we got to tell you, you're going over the top. He goes, oh, don't worry. Wait till you see what I give them for neighbors. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>